So hello, everybody. I'm Patty Wells from the Arctic Institute of North America, and I'd like to welcome everyone here tonight for one of our speaker series talks. Uh, before we get started, I just want to remind you that Karen Ryan from the Canadian Museum of History is going to be here next month in April the 18th. She was the curator of um, a, a large Franklin expedition exhibition that has been traveling everywhere, and she's going to give a talk on that next month. So uh, I thought I would start, first of all, and it's nice to see some familiar faces from the graduate students in the Department of Geography. Uh, last week, I was participating in, as a judge in the department's uh, graduate student paper competition. And it was so fantastic. Geography, I, now I remember why I love geography so much, because almost anything can be studied in a geography department, as was obvious from the huge array of topics that were covered by the graduate students in that competition. And tonight, I'm really happy to introduce another geographer, Trevor Bell, whose incredible energy and uh, curiosity in the world has sent him in a multitude of different places with the study of geography. He's a physical geographer, but he's and, and studies uh, seabed history, landscape, and uh, which are sort of topics that you think are typical for the field. Uh, but he's drawn to the people and the communities as well in his work. And in this way, he's been really creative in how he applies his geographic knowledge. And I met him, actually, when he was working with Priscilla Renouf, who was my supervisor and a really important person to the two of us. She was an archaeologist, and they worked together on the west coast of Newfoundland, where Priscilla had been spending years and years and years searching for maritime archaic sites. And when Trevor came on, he explained to her that a lot of the places she was searching had been underwater. So one of the topics that he's really interested in is um, landscape history and seascape history in that way. And so uh, he was able to really help her in understanding uh, what the landscape was like. And, and it wasn't just this sort of physical aspect of it. It was also together they were able to talk about how that landscape may have influenced those people in their decision of where they would settle in that area. And his interest in archaeology continued as he had a program called Cura, which um, looks at the coastline changes and the impact and the coming impact to archaeological resources in Newfoundland and elsewhere. But more recently, he's shifted to um, climate change and its impacts on modern communities in the north. Um, where the loss of stable and predictable ice cover is, uh, and sea level rising is affecting the lives of people in communities. So tonight he's going to talk specifically about that project, Smart Ice, and I will turn it over to you now, Trevor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patty. <laughs> is the volume okay for you? Uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you to the Arctic Institute for the invitation to come and talk to you this evening. Um, you brought me back a couple of decades in talking about the work with Priscilla and paleo landscapes. And I just add, wanted to add a piece that in addition to us understanding how people, uh, the landscape influenced prehistoric peoples on the Northern Peninsula of Newfoundland, we also looked at how they influenced the environment and found some evidence that they were influencing it 2,000 years ago by eutrophicating lakes in the area by cleaning seal skin pelts. But now I'm way off topic, so I need to come back. Um, I'm going to, well, let me, let me start off. I have a dedication for this uh, lecture, and I wanted to dedicate it to Lucas C. Peter. Lucas C. Peter is, was a hunter extraordinaire in, who lived in Iqaluit, who was born there. He was chosen as the lead harpoonist in the 2011 bowhead whale hunt in Iqaluit, which is the first time that has happened in living history. And so he was acknowledged quite by hunters in the region as being an exceptional person on the land. He also uh, completed the environmental technology program a, a couple of years ago and actually went back and uh, became their 
support person at the Arctic, at the Nunavut Arctic College. Or, and I'm sure most of you know, know the Nunavut Research Institute if you've applied for research permits. He was also a famous musician, and he loved uh, playing uh, Inuit music, and he was very accomplished. So unfortunately, we lost him last week, and um, I certainly appreciated his help in me getting started with Smart Ice in Iqaluit. Uh, back to the topic at hand, and in fact, this is a, a photograph of another one of our Smart Ice operators. This is on the ice between Baffin Island and Violet Island in the background. And because there's no scale here to help you, that distant shoreline is about 20 kilometers away. So you, these mountains literally rise up out of, the, out of the sea. And it's a good way to remind you that what I'm going to talk about tonight is not what you mostly hear about on the news, which is usually the sea ice over the, the polar sea ice, the polar ice cap, which you, know, you get to see these little cartoons of it, of it shrinking and expanding every year, and it's shrinking more than it ever has in the past. This is land fast ice. This is ice that's frozen to the shoreline in the channels between the islands of the archipelago and around the edges of the Arctic archipelago. So this is the ice that's connected to the shoreline and people travel on it. People hunt off it. This is very important to Inuit. In fact, um, Andrew Ariak, who's our smart ice operator in Pond Inlet, likes to remind me that this is, the sea ice is essential to their way of life. And so let me just, in his own words, tell you this. And so it is a reminder to tell you that without climate change, there would be no reason to have smart ice. Um, and I'm going to tell you what smart ice is in a minute. But really, Inuit have adapted to the changes in sea ice from one year to the next for the last, for centuries, millennia. So that it's only because the changes that we see now are so unprecedented and so unpredictable that we really need to help them with some of this technology that I'm going to talk about. I want to give you an example of how this impacts Inuit life. So we've heard about how the sea ice is a hunting platform, how it's a, it's a travel highway f between communities. But just to remind you that it, it, it's part of Inuit identity. It's part of their culture. And we're seeing that just gradually, year after year, diminishing. And so, at least for some of you in this room, and, and if you look at places like the north coast of Alaska, that ice will not form in your lifetime. Uh, most of our data tells us that that ice will not refreeze after the summer melt sometime in the 1950s. So we, this is something that's really an important issue, but it's often overlooked because we focus on the polar ice cap. So, Thinking to, let me give you an example. Um, this is the sea ice of Nain in Nunatsivut. Nunatsivut is in the Inuit land claim area for Labrador Inuit. It was the first Inuit land claim settlement. And this is the month of February, and it, in the winter of 2009, 2010. And it has rained all month, instead of it being minus 20 degrees Celsius. And as you can see, the ice that formed in December, in January, the surface of it has turned to slush and has melted and has, and has caused exceptional problems for the communities, not just along the Labrador coast, but it was felt right up into uh, Baffin Island. The Nunatsiwit government was smart enough to try and work out what was the impact of this warm winter on their Inuit, on Labrador Inuit. Because the climate scientists said, this is what you should expect. This is the face of climate change for you. Warm winters, 
with these exceptionally warm winters, and we can't tell you when they're going to happen. In fact, the same thing happened the following year, but we haven't seen one really as, as bad as that since. But in their, in their survey, this is what they found out. Of the people that they surveyed along the coast, 1 in 12 fell through the ice that winter. Now, you need to think about that. So I'm going to, of the people in the room here, 3, 4, 5 of you will have fallen through the ice. You think if there's a 1 in 12 accident for every vehicle traveling on your highways, what does that mean? Do you think, would people feel comfortable driving to work every day? And don't forget, I just told you how important sea ice is to people. It is where they get their country food to feed their family. It is part of their identity. Yet two-thirds of them felt scared when traveling on the ice that winter. Half of them didn't use their typical hunting trails. And because of that, they didn't get their usual seal and caribou. And therefore, their families, and once again, just to remind their households in northern Labrador, over 90% of them are food insecure. 90% of them. When you have these winters, it really, really has an impact on, on just feeding their families. Uh, in northern Labrador, they're close to forests, so they have to get, go across the sea ice to get firewood. That winter, because they couldn't travel the sea ice, they burnt their furniture to keep their houses warm. So this is, and, and climate change is really a disaster for Inuit. And that's, if there's only one message you take away from this talk, that's the message I want you to have. In response to that winter and the two winters that happened, the Nazi government asked me, I was, I, I was a research champion for them at the time, if there was any way in which we could bring technology to bear on this issue. It was, such a, it was, such a, it was having such an impact on the community. And that's really where Smart Ice started. And so this is Nain and Nunatsuit down here on the Labrador coast. And a couple of years after that, we were also took our technology that we developed and got some money to demonstrate it in a pilot community in Pond Inlet in, Nun in Nunavut. So briefly, I just want to show you what sort of technology that we developed to help Inuit travel safer on the ice. But an important part of what we did, an important part of uh, our understanding for what we were doing was that the technology was not to replace Inuit knowledge of the ice. It, could, it, it was to augment it, but not replace it. Because I think the idea of handing someone a GPS and thinking that they can find their way around uh, just doesn't really work. So handing Inuit technology and replacing it replacing your Inuit knowledge wouldn't work either. You need that Inuit knowledge of sea ice and sea ice travel, so we're simply augmenting it. So one of the things we did was we developed a stationary sea ice thickness sensor using some technology that was already out there, uh, thermistor strips. Um, so I'm just going to just quickly, before I change slides, show you this is sticking out of the ice. This is off Pond Inlet, Violet Island again in the background. So this sensor will extend down through the snow below the ice and into the underlying ocean. And so they're fairly substantial because it gives you some idea of how thick the sea ice forms typically in these areas. And this is what schematically it looks like. We, have, uh, we built it so that it, it could be replaceable, it could be made cheaply. So this, if you think that looks like four-inch sewer pipe, it's because it is four-inch sewer pipe filled with something that's buoyant and allows it to float in the, in, in, the, in the water. Electronics are up the middle. And basically, we're using temperature gradients between an ocean, ah, sorry, um, between an ocean that is basically about minus 1 degree and an air temperature that's in the order of minus 20 to minus 40 degrees. That temperature gradient, because of the different nature of uh, ice and snow will have a different gradient and we can differentiate from the temperature graphs where is the snow and where is the ice. So it's fairly simple uh, technology. But with, um, with satellite communication up here, it essentially is relaying this information directly back to the community. So you can deploy these instruments along 
community trails, which are, which are hazardous. The first ones to thin, the first ones to become dangerous. They can be hundreds of kilometers away from the community, so people don't have to travel there to find out that they're dangerous. They can plan their, their travel on the ice before they leave. So that was one way in which to uh, help and increase safe travel. The second one is a, is a mobile sea ice thickness sensor. We call this the smart cometic. And here, essentially, we've got a conductivity meter on uh, a sled or a cometic. And this is working from some, tech, uh, some uh, knowledge created by Christian Haas, where you can take the conductivity difference between the fresh sea ice and the, the salty seawater, if you like. And with electromagnetic energy, you can basically detect the thickness of the sea ice. And what we did was we actually took that technology and up, ruggedized it for the Arctic and then made it so that you could generate real-time ice thickness beneath the operator. So as the person's traveling on the ice, they're actually seeing the thickness of the ice beneath the cometic. And this is, this is really reassuring for people, uh, for Inuit traveling on the ice. In this case, you can see it's 4.8 feet we use what the community wants. In this case, they use feet. They don't use metric. So once again, making that quite obvious and then building this so that it can be operated with very thick gloves because you're out there in minus 40 degrees and, and be able to see where you're traveling. When the operator comes back into the community, that information is automatically downloaded. And it generates a color-coded sea ice thickness track of where the operator traveled. So here is Pond Inlet on the northern tip of uh, Baffin Island. This is Eclipse Sound. It's actually covered with ice. This is a radar image, so it's not a visual image. So where it's nice and black, it means it's fairly smooth ice. And this is multi-year ice here, which is rough and thick. And so he traveled out here. This took him a whole day to go out and back. And he's traveling out to the flow edge. So here, the difference between these lines and here is about you know, 600 meters of water depth. So, but this is an incredibly important and productive area for Inuit and from Pond Inlet. They travel out there to hunt because it's, it's very biologically productive. So there's lots of seals, polar bears, beluga, whatever it might be out there. And so, but you can see because this is freshly formed ice, it can get very thin. In some cases, they were traveling on less than uh, one foot thickness of ice. So he traveled along the flow edge and then traveled back. You can see towards the west, it is thicker, it's more blue in this area, six to seven feet. And then you can see the areas where it's one or two or three feet thick. What is the minimum safe level of thickness? Depends on the type of ice and the temperature of the ice. Yeah. So a meter thickness of ice when it's minus 20 versus a meter thickness of ice in June when the temperature is plus 4, totally different. One is incredibly hazardous and you don't go on it. The other is you can put a tank on it. In fact, off Tuktoyotuk right now, they're landing Hercules on the, on the sea ice. It's about 5 or 6 feet thick. So, and then, so this information... Uh, immediately becomes available to the community when they get back into it again, into when the operator comes back. We also produce maps, unlike the ones that the Canadian Ice Service makes, that's the Government of Canada's Ice Centre, they only make maps um, to support shipping. And so they don't make sea ice maps in the Canadian Arctic in the wintertime because there's no shipping up there. But don't forget, there are people living there who might benefit from that. So perhaps we're trying to convince them to change that approach. And certainly very often they don't classify the ice in these areas, landfast ice next to the coastline, because ships don't often go there. They're out more in the open water. So really, we've created these, these maps to support Inuit travel, so over ice travel as opposed to true ice travel. And we've worked very closely with the communities to both develop a legend that's relatively straightforward 
and the, what this legend means where it incorporates uh, rough ice as well as thin ice or open water leads, uh, cracks. And so we come up with a, a, a first phase of the map is something that's fairly straightforward like this. In the community, we make this available. We're working with an Inuit knowledge network platform called SIKU to display that map on the internet. So literally, as fast as the operator comes back into the community and puts away the gear, goes back to the house, the map is already on the internet that they've made. We also still print them off for elders who don't own computers and, and don't have computers available to them. We use flat screen TVs in co-ops, airports, public places to, make, to display it. And through SICU, we're developing, uh, well, the, the app is developed uh, for, your, for your cell phone. And of course, lots of younger generations of Inuit and communities have cell phone and cell phone coverage. And so the elders have asked us to create these apps of, so that this information is available to them because you can travel out on the ice. All, all telephones have a built-in GPS, so you can, once you download our map before you leave the cell coverage, you can travel hundreds of kilometers away on our maps um, and help stay safe. So essentially, Smart Ice is our attempt to empower communities to adapt to changing climate. And in our particular case, it's unpredictable sea ice. But let me, uh, let me have somebody from the community tell you a little bit about what they want from, from Smart Ice. I'm really excited about this Smart Ice technology. Is the first part is, is that you're putting technology into local people's hands, which I think is really good. If it's going to be successful, you're going to have to do that, or it's going to have to be able to be something that people here can utilize, but then also benefit from. Um, from a public safety issue, I think that it's really good. We have a lot of, especially here in Macaulay, because it's unique, we have a lot of Indian that come to this community from other communities. So the local experience and the local knowledge on the ice around Macaulay uh, that people from here have is not always shared or is not known by new people that move here. So it's, it, it, I see this new ice technology being able to help younger hunters, uh, uh, people that are not necessarily from here. Um, and uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing the results and, and, and what comes out of it. So for us, a game changer was when we were nominated and shared the Arctic Inspiration Prize in 2016. Up to this point, we were essentially, Smart Eyes was a community, university, government research partnership. So we had funding from different levels of government and communities to, to pilot what we were doing in Nain and, and Pond Inlet in Nunavut. But we kept get, getting asked for Smart Eyes in other communities. And of course, we didn't have the money available to suddenly move communities. So we thought about how do we actually create a service or expand that service to other communities. So we were nominated by uh, people from actually the Kikatala Corporation, the chair of the Kikatala Corporation in Nunavut and the chair of the uh, Nunatsivut Development Corporation in Nunatsivut to actually form a business. And the business we chose to create, the type of business, was a social enterprise. A social enterprise, as many of you know, does, does not have owners or shareholders. So its primary uh, goal is not to make money for those owners. It's essentially to maximize social impact and to create positive community change. So I, there was a small video around when, when we received this, and it explains why we chose that particular model. SmartEyes has a grander vision, and it has brought together a truly remarkable and diverse team to make it happen. They will create the northern social enterprise, SmartEyes Incorporated, for communities to provide sea ice information for local travel safety and sustainable resource development, while also reflecting Inuit societal values, such as respecting and caring for the environment and community, and being innovative and resourceful. 
The Smart Rights Inc. business model commits to maximizing social impact and creating positive community change while applying an entrepreneurial approach to the delivery of DI's information services across the Arctic. So what does that mean? What does that look like? Well, in the two years since we received the Arctic Inspiration Prize, we've expanded from the two pilot communities, and we're now operating in the yellow communities. In fact, we're going to, by this end of this ice season, operating in 15 communities. And we're actively working with a dozen more communities to raise funds to bring the equipment in and to get started in the communities. So we estimate that in, by 2022, or let's say our plan, is to be operating in 30 communities. And once we have, um, so I was just recently, well, a couple of days ago, I was up in Tuk Tuk talking to them about bringing Smart Ice there. And uh, we're actively working with the Canadian Armed Forces to deploy it as a situational awareness uh, uh, technology for putting troops and aeroplanes onto the ice. And we're also talking to the Hunters and Fishers Associations in Greenland and other communities in Alaska who are interested in, in smart ice. But I think what I want to do and for the rest of the talk, show you that we're not just a technology innovation. We want to do a lot more than that. And that's, what a, that's the whole idea behind a social enterprise. So the first thing we're really interested in doing is sort of uh, building self-determination for research in Inuit communities. So Smart Ice, although we have an executive director based in St. John's, in every community that we operate, we establish a management group made up of representatives from uh, organizations in the community that use sea ice or individuals who use it. So in Pond Inlet here, there. They call themselves Sukumiat, people of the ice. There's about eight or 12 people involved, and they tell Smart Ice how to operate in the community. But you think that that's, uh, might, somebody might think, well, that's a bit dodgy for a, a corporation to be allowing a community to, to tell you what to do. Well, in fact, that's the whole idea behind Inuit self-determination. You're working in their communities, and they're the ones who should be dictating how you operate. But as opposed to it being a negative thing, we only see positive impacts of this. So this, our committees in these communities tell us about, give us ideas about new technology. They give us ideas for new projects and send us off to get funding to do that. And most importantly of all, they, they remind us how important Inuit knowledge is and how we need to combine Inuit knowledge and technology. And so they have really asked us, they, they have said to us, for instance, that they have never had the opportunity to document Inuit knowledge. Inuit knowledge is an oral tradition. So they would want us to document Inuit knowledge of, of ice so that they could be shared with the younger generations who don't have the same opportunities to be on the land or to have that knowledge transfer. And so they've asked us to... Um, for instance, start off by documenting the Nuktatuk sea ice terminology. So in the last couple of months, this is in Pond Inlet, we have been working, we, and they also wanted the youth to be the ones who work with the elders. So we're not doing the research, we're facilitating it. And so Andrew has been working with the elders. In this one session, we documented 43 terms for sea ice, depending on whether it's freeze up, break up, whether it's the light season or the dark season. And that's only half of it. So we have to go back and document a lot more. And what we're trying to do then is to identify which of these terms refer to travel hazards. And then we're interested because they've asked us to look at how this has changed over the last 20 years. So we're going back to the archive of radar satellite imagery and which documents basically the changing ice dynamics around these communities. And we're training uh, youth in the community to interpret that satellite imagery. So we're able to see how have these hazards changed? How have the cracks, the polynias, the rough ice, how is their location or the, 
their extent changed over the last 20 years. And then to, once again, communicate that to the community. And we have some other ideas how we're developing that even to create an operational service where we're able to use the, the last image that was taken as the satellite went overhead and have our operators immediately produce a, a sea ice hazard map for the community using their own terminology in Nuktatuk, using their own knowledge of hazards, in addition to the Western science, of course. That's one example. Smart ice is also not simply just a social enterprise. It's what's called a WISE, a work-integrated social enterprise. So we're really interested in when we offer our services in communities to provide employment and employment supports for youth in the communities to um, remove, in some cases, employment barriers and to give them the sorts of supports that they need. So these are our operators. They're key people from Kikatarjawak to Pond Inlet to Arctic Bay to Iqaluit. These are operators that are essentially uh, providing two-way knowledge with us. And to create these opportunities is really impo important from employment and training perspectives. We are also trying to be socially innovative as well. So do you remember those smart buoys that I told you about, that we, the stationary sea ice thickness sensors? So we now, as we expand to 25, 30 communities, we have to maybe provide three, four, five of those for each community every couple of years. So if we were just an ordinary for-profit company, we'd say, OK, well, we have this incredible design. We'd go to a technology production company in Mississauga, for instance, in Toronto, ask them to fabricate that design, mass produce 150 of them, and then ship them up to communities. So what happens in that situation? While the employment is in Toronto, the profits that they make in selling it to companies, to communities, stays in Toronto. And once again, Inuit pay the price. So we're trying to do that differently. So this year, we're going to be opening up the first ever technology production center in the Arctic. We have redesigned how we put, assemble these smart buoys, which in the prototyping stage, we had masters in electrical engineer, engineering and, and computer programming putting these together. And we've simplified that process so that we can train Inuit youth to actually assemble these smart buoys and then deliver them around the Arctic. So I can stand up like I did earlier in the week in a community hall in Tuktoyaktuk and say, when you receive your smart buoy, there's going to be a little label on it that says, made by Inuit youth for Inuit communities. And of course, Inuit Ute constantly surprise us. Uh, we've used a stepping stone approach here. We partnered with um, at-risk homeless youth in St. John's, some of who are indigenous. We provided the training to them, so we give them a lot of employment supports, not just to make these devices. And of course, they ended up making the first uh, smart buoy in half the time that we thought that they would, and perfectly. So we expect Inuit Ute to, to even make them faster because there's lots of potential there. So this is, what, this is what we think is the right way to do this, and maybe hopefully breaking those glass ceilings for other enterprises, whether they're social enterprises or for-profit enterprises, to think differently about how production can take place in the North for the North. The other thing that we have to think about is, as a social enterprise, is sustainability. So right now, we've been able to, very successful at getting money to support the initiation of Smart Ice in those 15 communities and hopefully 30 communities in a couple of years. But you know, for any of you who've been to the Arctic, you know and, or know anything about it, you know that it's littered with failed monitoring services, where the federal government provides money for a couple of years, and then the service gets abandoned, 
and the community wonders, where did those people go to? They suddenly were here for a couple of years and then we never saw them again. Or what's that big white thing up on the hill? Is it still working? Um, so it's, it's, having spent a lot of time in communities, it's easy to be cynical about this. But what keeps me awake at night is I don't want Smart Eyes to be one of them. So how do we move from something that's uh, relying right now on government support to being sustainable? So I want to tell you a little bit about what that story is. And really the plan, in a nutshell, is a combination of a commercial clients purchasing the service and we hope uh, governments purchasing the service as an essential public service for these, um, for these communities. The ice isn't going to get better in these communities. We're living with climate change, whether we like it or not, because of the greenhouse gases we put in the atmosphere for the next 50 years. So we need this service to be there, and in fact, we need it to be even better as climate change intensifies. So what's the, what's the sustainability plan? Well, in these, in these communities, we do have industries. For instance, we have a uh, fishing industry. So this is Pangatung, and fishermen with hand lines collect and, and bring in millions of dollars of quota of uh, turbot every year. In fact, so well that they have a, one of two fish processing plants in Nunavut located in the community of Pangatung. But every year they leave a million dollars of quota in the water because of unpredictable sea ice or unsafe sea ice. So we've been talking to them about how can Smart Ice provide and adapt our services to support their fishing effort. So even if they were to get half of that quota, another $500,000 worth, well the service for Smart Ice probably costs ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a year. So they pay for the service, they increase their profits, and the community gets it for free. So we're actively working with these fishing companies, Arctic Fisheries Alliance, Baffin Fisheries, and Kiktalik Fisheries, and they have already supported Smart Ice to be initiated in some of these communities. So they, they like this idea and are actively helping us make this happen. Smart Ice Tourism. So every year, very rich tourists travel up to uh, Arctic communities, Inuit communities, and Inuit take them out onto the ice to the flow edge. And in the springtime, they sit there watching, and there's these incredibly productive areas, and there's lots of wildlife, polar bears, seals, birds, whales, and as you can see, cameras are really important, and, and just being there and seeing this and feeling. But of course, Taking them across the ice is becoming increasingly hazardous. And it's an industry that if you have an accident or a close encounter, it probably can ruin your reputation for a long time. So, you know, in Arctic Bay, there were break-offs of the ice, and you had 40 tourists floating off into the Arctic Ocean until they were saved by a helicopter. So you don't want that to happen. So we're working with funding, we're working with Arctic Bay Adventures, which is a community-based tourism company, to see how we can adapt Smart Ice services to actually focus right in on helping them ensure that uh, the, the tourists are safe, but also their experience is heightened by, you know, maybe riding on the Smart Comatic for a while and then getting a printout of, of the safe sea ice track and just being involved in that, in that uh, uh, safety and situational awareness. And, you know, tourism industry is interested in this. And this would include many communities, especially in the Baffin region, over the Cambridge Bay and further. Shipping in the Arctic is increasing, ironically, because sea ice is becoming uh, thinner and, and, and breaks up earlier and freezes up later. So I watched, for instance, in Pond Inlet in November, the ore ships going into the uh, largest ore ships in the world, traveling into the Murray River mine just to the west of Pond Inlet, breaking the ice. They were being led by icebreakers and breaking the ice. And the track of that ship can still be seen in the ice of Pond Inlet today if you look at the radar satellite images. So shipping impacts sea ice right through the entire winter. And what we're interested in is how, 
How, in fact, does it, does it accelerate the breakup of it, which would be a, you know, really impact the community's well-being and how they can secure food? In some cases, like this one, this is off the coast of Labrador. This is the MV Arctic going into the Voises Bay mine, just south of Nain. And the ship got caught in, a, in, a, in an ice ridge here for 10 days. So for 10 days, for 24 hours a day, the ship reversed and rammed the ice and made no headway. At $50,000 a day, that's a lot of money. We came out with Joey Angatok with the smart comatic. In this case, we mapped out thin ice and showed them how they could get out of, uh, how they could get out of that ice. But Joey said when he went out there, there wasn't a seal to be seen. There wasn't a, any wildlife anywhere around because of the, the noise was deafening of the ship ramming at full power into the, into the ice ridge. Um, so they recognized that they also need to help these ships, which are permitted to go in and out uh, once every four weeks or so uh, to, to a shipping agreement. So we, we work with Baffin, Land Valley, FedNav, these different companies, and uh, the communities want us to be involved because we hire local people using Inuit knowledge of the ice. So people trust the information that we generate. Even if the companies use the exact same instrumentation, the communities won't trust them because, of course, why, why would they? they? They have 50 years of a legacy of of not telling them the truth. Lastly, around um, uh, search and rescue. So ultimately, we feel that you know, it's a hard thing to quantify how many people didn't have an accident on the ice. So it's difficult, but let me just give you some idea of the costs. When there's a search and rescue event up off, uh, let's say, northern Baffin Island, you have to deploy and activate uh, the, the major infrastructures. So those infrastructures are located, of course, down in the south, at Trenton, Halifax, and Victoria. So from here, if you're going to search for somebody on the ice, you're going to have to bring a helicopter up. And it'll have to fly, getting multiple fuel stops, probably for about 12 hours before they get up to Pond Inlet. And because after that 12 hours, the flight crew no longer can fly because they've used up all their flying time. They would have to actually sit idle for maybe 12 to 24 hours. They're not much good in a search and rescue situation. They have to fly a Hercules with the helicopter to carry extra crew so that the minute they get up into the region, they can immediately deploy into the search and rescue. And then when successful, they return back down again. So I don't need to give you the accurate sum for this, but it's hundreds of thousands of dollars, just one trip. And so if we can avoid them having to do that, that would pay for smart ice operating in multiple communities over multiple years. So my challenge is to convince our government ministers that smart ice can save them money. And between you and me, the biggest challenge I have is civil servants tell me the government is not interested in saving money. And so my, argu my argument, <laughs> this entire argument, I can't use on ministers. I really have to just revert back to, and properly so, to it saves people's lives. But when you, when you actually save money in the federal government, you don't really because they, they have to give that same amount of budget to that uh, department anyway. Um, in 2017, Smart Ice was recognized by the United Nations for its unique climate solution. And so we are one of 19 projects worldwide that won this award. In fact, we were the, only the second time a, an organization in Canada won it. The other one was the province of British Columbia for the carbon tax. And we were the first ever award in the Arctic, which I found incredible. And this, this award has been around many, well, at least a decade or more. But ironically, people aren't that focused on an international level and at the United Nations on the Arctic, as I found out when we got that award. But what this award does is meant to emphasize uh, the innovation, 
the scalability, which I think I've talked about, the reclable, and the practical examples of what you know, we can do to actually combat climate change, in our case, climate change adaptation. I wanted to give you two examples before I finish here um, about how we're doing that, how we're looking forward, how we're anticipating that the next 50 years of climate change is going to cause a real change in the sea ice. So the first thing we do, and we just got funding from the Canadian Northern Economic Development Agency and MITAX to hire some technology experts, in fact, a postdoc from York University, to, to help us develop a separate sensor than the one that I showed you that will um, be able to map not just sea ice thickness, but also slush, the currents of slush and its thickness and snow. Why slush? Slush in the springtime causes maybe most of the search and rescue events that we that are experienced in the north. People, so slush happens when you have, in fact, people might think it's about warming temperatures, and it is partly, but it's not. It's about actually increasing precipitation. So it's forecast there's going to be a more snow precipitation in the Arctic as the atmosphere gets warmer, can hold more moisture. And the additional weight of the snow on the ice in the springtime pushes it down and causes the, the seawater to flood the ice and it floods it between the ice and the snow. So you're driving along in your skidoo, happy as ever, a nice warm day in Calgary, and then you go boom, down into the slush. And you, your machine is stalled probably, and you have to walk home. And if you're 50, 100 kilometers away from your community, and the bigger and stronger we get our skidoos, the farther you can travel, then that causes the search and rescue issues. So we're trying to be able to produce our maps that show where the extent of slush is as this phenomenon uh, becomes more common in, in springtime in the north. The second thing that we're doing is something we're calling smart ice freshwater. And we're funding, and we've actually got the technology, and now we're going to start working with communities. So in, in the northern provinces, northern Ontario, northern Saskatchewan, Northern Manitoba, Northwest Territories. There are 10,000 kilometers of winter trails, which for a couple of weeks to a couple of months every winter, resupply isolated, remote First Nations communities, hundreds of them. And when, as with climate change, that window is starting to close and the ice is starting to fail as it, because it typically, although a lot of these winter trails are over land, but sometimes they're over rivers and they're over lakes. And as that water is warmer, the ice is thinner, the season's getting shorter and you're getting breakthroughs, you're getting fuel trucks going through the ice as happened a couple of years ago in, Nova, in NWT in Delaney. Who pays for that? Federal government. Federal government has to fly in that fuel for the, for the following year. The bulk food, the building materials, all of that is resupplied. And, if it, and as you can see here, you can see the parts of the houses being driven along the winter trail. Almost none of these winter trails are monitored, except some of them, which you see on television, going to the diamond mines. And they are obviously monitored by consultants who are, diamond mines are able to pay. What we want to do with Smart Ice is empower these First Nations communities with our technology and our service to be able to monitor their own ice and to use their own traditional knowledge about where is safe on the ice, what type of ice is safe. So we're working with some of these First Nations communities, the, the uh, National Research Council, and to actually bring this service into communities. We're starting that conversation. So that's a huge expansion for us and allows us also probably to support indigenous communities in Russia as well, in parts of Scandinavia, also communities that are using and uh, uh, accessing lake ice for, for resupply. My last slide is just to remind me to tell you that, I mean, for me, I hope I've convinced you that there are a lot of benefits for, of smart ice for communities, 
not just climate adaptation, but travel safety. But uh, I, what I believe the greatest legacy, or maybe I hope that the greatest legacy of Smart Eyes is you know, that it essentially inspires youth, Inuit youth, who make up over some communities, 60% of the population is under 30 or 25. That it encourages them to, it harnesses their potential, and I think also inspires them to embrace technology, research, science, education, to sort of see the, as, as a sort of a driver for economic uh, development and well-being in their communities. So thank you very much, and I think uh, I'm happy to take some questions. I'm not sure. I'm working on that. I have a, I have a plan. Oh, good. Well, it's, it's about being replaced by um, Inuit. So right now we hire, in addition to the operators and communities that are casual, we have full-time uh, Inuit hired in, in each of the regions to be our op regional operations leads. And the, so th we're really building that and mentoring that uh, generation and everybody that we hire for Smart Ice that's non-Inuit, we tell them your first job is to, is to sh have somebody shadow you and you're giving up your job to that person. And also the other thing that we are working with is gender equality in, in our positions. And that's difficult because, of course, ICE users are typically male and that's the roles they play in communities. But I'm really happy to say that uh, tomorrow I'll be offering a young female in a, one of those regional operation leads positions in the Kikitalik region. Well, we hope we have dealt with a lot of those technical issues when like, the, some of the sensors that we bring with us are for use in southern Ontario. Uh, conductivity meters, you walk in fields with it over your shoulder to, to detect buried pipelines or whatever. So we have taken the electronics apart and, and re-solidified it so it can adjust to the shakes of being on the sea ice. We've also installed heaters in them to keep them warm. And the, um, we have a tough pad, an I, a toughened iPad in here with a heater behind it to keep, so it keeps functioning at minus 40 degrees Celsius. So we got rid of Bluetooth because most Bluetooth only, if you read the small print, is only rated for minus 20. So we, we tend to hardwire things. So uh, in this case, we can't use uh, ropes uh, many cometics are pulled by a rope, uh, especially over very rough ice. So we have to use a hard hitch because we have a wire. And because those hard hitches are usually made of metal, that means that we need a very large cometic and we need to put the, the electromagnetic sensor to the back as far away from that metal as possible until this week where the hunters in Tuktoyotuk showed me how you can make a plastic hitch. And I watched them, I photographed, I should have had them up there, but of them taking a, a piece of plastic pipe, cut it into four lengths, so now you have four strips, and you can bolt that together and you can, it, it's perfect, it bends, it doesn't get brittle when it's really cold and snap, the only problem, just like when you're pulling them with a rope, you, if you suddenly stop, you can have a cometic come into you pretty fast. So, but it, it bends. It doesn't, it's not like a rope. It won't run you over. So what's, what's the, the lifespan, you think, of uh, one of these units? Are they to replace it in five years, in two years? Um, what if one falls through the ice? You know, is that I, the cost built in? Or? Oh, yes. I mean, and that's we're constantly, like I'm... Tomorrow I'm heading up to Callaway and I will be bringing a replacement because I think it's got too much roughness because the ice is, is quite rough there this year and so I'm bringing another one up. But we usually can fix them and send them back up. The bigger expense is shipping things and traveling up north. 
you know, very often my plane tickets are over ten thousand dollars for what I do. But I'm moving around a bit. But it's it, we need to start looking at that as a as a real obstacle for development in the north. Yeah, so, yeah, well, is it, when it's really cold and it's a dark season and the ice is, once you've established the ice thickness, it's, it's probably less, uh, less than once a week. But the, the, the fishermen in the, in the fall who are, who are trying to access the lakes for char want people, want us out there going west, not towards the flow edge, but west inland as early as possible. So you're going out on thin ice. And so they want those trails mapped. And then, of course, in the springtime, when everything is starting to get dynamic, you're going out maybe twice a week. So it, it varies a little bit about seasonally when that is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, you notice I don't talk about the tradition, the Inuit knowledge becoming unreliable. It's, 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 the word I use is inconsistent with the rate of change of, of, that's going on. So, but when we talk to Inuit, when you, when you sit with them for a couple of days and are talking about ice, their knowledge of that ice and their knowledge of the hazards of that ice are incredible. And we'll never be able to see necessarily some of that from space. And we can't detect it with these sensors. But you have situations where they talk about where after a certain sequence of events and you get snow onto open water and the snow doesn't melt, it sits there. And you can't, I can't tell the difference between the sea ice and the snow. And sometimes the younger generation don't. And they drive this canoe right over and of course, there's nothing supporting them, and they, that's what happens. But, and you're right in saying that in some cases that traditional knowledge is failing. How do we know that? Because it's not just youth that are dying on the ice, it is experienced hunters as well, where things have changed dramatically. But it's the point is well, for them, they want the younger generations to have the, the best chance, so to have the knowledge that they have to be able to, to navigate this unpredictability. They still have to go out on the ice. They still have to hunt for their families. They still need seal. And um, so they have to go out there. It's part of who they are. And so it's more, it's more how can we give them all the tools that are available, all the knowledge available. And if I may, I'm going to springboard from your question into something a little bit larger. Lots of people always ask me, you know, this is a big challenge in all across the Arctic and all across indigenous groups across the world is because indigenous knowledge and Western science are two different worldviews. This idea that, you know, how do we integrate them? You read lots of government mission statements about, you know, integrating these two things to develop policy. That's not going to happen probably. There are different worldviews, there are different experiences. Um, I can show you a graph of Western science and I could also bring you one of our operators in to tell you a story. They're both incredibly valid and they have the same type of information in them. So how do we do that? From all of my experience of working in the Arctic, I'm not going to try to. What I am going to do is I'm going to take the Inuit knowledge holder and I'm going to train them to be the scientist. And so we have applications in right now that 
that uh, essentially instead of us making some company rich in the south making these maps right now of the, the ice hazard maps, we're going to train Inuit who, who are out on the ice all the time to be the remote sensor, to be the satellite image interpreter. And they're going to do it in their own communities, and they're going to produce the maps for their own communities. And that then obviously gives them lots of transferable skills, improves their employment opportunities, and it's a better map. It's a better map because they have incorporated into where they draw the lines the fact that they've just been on the ice and experienced it. And the community has more trust in the map because it's made by one of their own and it incorporates local knowledge. So that's, I know that was a bit of a digression. Mm -hmm. Is that something that just stays in the community? Because there's a lot of linguistic, or uh, at least I think there is in terms of all, uh, variation across various things in Oregon. How do you try and keep that as a, the way of freedom you have to consider when you're making knowledge applied to the security? Or is everything sort of kept within one community? We do it in every community oh, okay. because the ice conditions are different and the terminology is different. I mean, it may have lots of similarity between Arctic Bay and Pond Inlet and Clyde River because they're all adjacent to each other. There are lots of family connections and they're traveling. But there's no way that Kikatarjoak and uh, Pond Inlet have the same ice. And they have the different terminology. And they don't have those family connections as much. So we do it in each of the regions. And the, and the hazardous ice is very different. And so when I'm last week up in Tuck, and there, I mean, it's a world of difference to the ice in the Western Arctic versus the Eastern Arctic and the things that they deal with. So it's, yeah, it's very specific. And my second question was, um, what's up with Quebec? I know you map of Canada and you're yeah. obviously there's a notion So we're talking with those reg the regional government and we're going to start a pilot in there. And that's just, uh, it's more about you always start these things with, connections and, and snowballing in the direction of who, at this point, it's who phones us sort of and wants, the, wants smart ice sort of is, is gaining our attention. Um, but uh, in December, I talked to the regional government there, and they're interested in piloting it. And, and people who work in those communities tell me that they would like to have smart ice, but sometimes the hierarchical uh, responsibilities mean that you have to go a certain way. So you have to do it respectfully. And we only go where we're invited. And um, what else could I say about that? I mean, it takes time. It takes two years at least for us to bring smart ice into a community. It takes only hours to bring the equipment in, but it takes years to build the trust of the community and to get all of these things lined up. Uh, sorry, one here and then, then to you. No. They, they want to know basically roughly the conditions. And obviously for the ice thickness, the track, it's within several centimeters, obviously, what that is. But of course, in some places like uh, Iqaluit, where they said, you know, the, the ice hazard map I showed you, they said, don't even bother making them for Iqaluit because they have a 15 meter tidal range. And every time the, the tide comes in and it goes out, it changes the ice conditions so much. So they said it's better that you bring in two smart comatics and do twice the amount of survey because the ice, the, the tidal regime is changing the ice so much. So in some, so it, it, it varies by, very much about what people want us to be mapping and, and what that might mean. And you know, in many cases I have to remind you that the ice is thinning in many cases from underneath. So, I, and I need to point that out, that in, it, it's not necessarily, it is, of course, partly temperature, which is warming the water and 
uh, causing the ice to freeze up later and maybe melt, uh, melt earlier. But we're actually seeing a difference in the strength of the currents, the surface currents and the direction of those currents. So the ice has actually been eroded and thinned from underneath. So people like elders traveling on the ice perceived there to be no difference and they're falling through because it's actually on, it's been thinned from underneath. So we have to be careful what the community wants and so they tell us what, what they need. So sometimes they say, well, the map's gonna be useless, don't even bother, let's focus on something else. Yeah. How do they cross one of those? And then the third one was they used to use sled dogs. Yeah. And I heard sled dogs were pretty good at keeping them safe. Yeah. They didn't really go on the dangerous ice. So any chance they might some of them might go back to sled dogs. Well, of course, there's a legacy around sled dogs, which you probably always heard about. The RCMP went into communities and killed them all. But let's not get into that one. <laughs> um, uh, now I've forgotten your question. Uh, um, the cost. The cost. Well, the, well I, the first thing I'd say is who's asking? Because, of course, it's, if, if we have a big shipping, multinational shipping company, well, there's a larger cost to some of these things. But the smart, the smart buoy, we would hope to be selling for ten or $15,000, as opposed to what you can buy commercially now is hundreds of thousands of dollars, probably, the ones the Canadian Ice Service buy. And of course, it's Inuit Ute building them. So it's had that, it doesn't mean that the standard is any less. They still have to pass all the, the QC. Uh, but it is a little bit more expensive than probably we would, would want based on the materials. The smart, the smart Cometic, probably 65,000, 75,000 just for, for materials. You buy the conductivity meter, you ruggedize it, you buy the, the um, the tough pad, you build the enclosure, you know. So, so the quote I got last week, if I bought multiple units of materials for the smart buoy, was $8,000. So that everything else on top of that is Inuit Ute labor. Most of this, we can do the labor and get the, but you know, it costs almost as much to ship it up north. So I'm trying to take it as extra baggage every time I fly north, just so I don't have to pay $800 to ship a suitcase. I, th I think it is. So, yeah. And did you have a second question? Okay, the one is, how do they cross those channels every time an icebreaker? So, two, two ways. Um, in, in Nunatsiavut, in Labrador, in Voises Bay, Inuit came up with a, a, a pontoon bridge okay. that they drag out across the, the ship track. And, and people use that with, for their skidoos until it, it's safe to freeze over. In other places, and they were proposing this up in Pond Inlet, they were actually going to accelerate the freezing. I mean, when it's minus 30, minus 40 outside, things freeze really fast, but you can, you can pump water on it and thicken that ice, that ice bridge. I mean, that's what you're making is an ice bridge across it. And so one of our roles would be to monitor, help make that and monitor the thickness for the community. Yeah. And, and because of that, we're already seeing that the, that the indigenous knowledge is starting to become a little obsolete, right? Mm, not obsolete, so less consistent. Yeah. Less consistent. Yeah. So, less consistent. So, here's the thing. So, how come you're putting so much focus on trying to preserve these most of these primitive economic systems um, rather than trying to shift them or encourage the communities towards urbanization? Is this don't you think that would be more economically feasible? Hmm, interesting question. So why do you live in Calgary? And what have we told you to go live somewhere else? So for a long time there has been, colonialism has been attempting to dictate to Inuit who live on their own land what they should do. So to prevent them from pursuing their own culture, they shot their dogs. 
In some cases, they stopped them uh, speaking their own language. We're only now starting to recognize that, and Canada as a country is apologizing to them for, for taking only a couple of weeks ago in Arviat, the minister um, apologized for the Canadian government taking inland Inuit that didn't live by the coast and had their own traditions and transplanted them onto the coastline about 30 years ago just to minimize the cost of providing services to them. And they've done that repeatedly up to Resolute Bay and other places. So that, that idea that we, ha we, can, we, we have a better answer for how they should live, this is an incredibly culturally rich people who for millennia have been living off the land and surviving and, and enjoying it. People, sometimes people tell me, say to me, you know, well, is it the fact that it's so dark up there why young people are committing suicide 37 times the national average in the South? And that's such a, a non-informed question because, of course, they have, that's part of their culture and their livelihood is to have a dark season and a light season. And so it's totally unrelated to that. So I think we have to be really careful in, in the questions we ask and maybe the, the assumptions we make about whether their lives will be better somewhere else. And I think part of uh, a, a big issue that the world is facing is ultimately climate change, mass movement of people. We're going to see it probably out of deserts. Maybe we will see it out of the Arctic as it changes completely. But that is their choice. And um, my, my obligation after having lived and traveled in the North for a long time is to actually just help them and empower them to make those decisions for themselves. Okay. Thanks. Thank you for your question.